Welcome to No War 2017, War and the Environment. Raise your hand if you were out on the water in a kayak on Sunday in front of the Pentagon and you might be in this picture. During World War I, we should note, the U.S. Army used land that is now a part of the campus we are on to create and test out chemical weapons. Then it buried what Karl Rove might have called vast stockpiles underground, left, and forgot about them until a construction crew uncovered them in 1993. The cleanup is ongoing with no end in sight. One place the Army used tear gas was on its own veterans when they came back to D.C. to demand bonuses. Then, during the Second World War, the U.S. military dumped huge quantities of chemical weapons into the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. There are six Superfund sites poisoning the Potomac River not far from here, and as Pat Elder has noted, uh, they are all military sites. They are poisoning the Potomac with everything from acetone, alkaline, arsenic, anthrax, on down to vinyl chloride, xylene, and zinc. 69% of Superfund sites across the United States are military bases. And this is the country for which this military is supposedly performing some sort of so-called service. What the US military and other militaries do to the Earth as a whole is unfathomable, or at least unfathomed. The US military is the top consumer of petroleum around, burning more than most entire countries. What war and war preparations do to the Earth has always been a hard topic to get at. Why would those who care about the Earth want to take on the beloved and inspiring institution that brought us Vietnam, Iraq, the famine in Yemen, torture at Guantanamo, and 16 years of gruesome slaughter in Afghanistan, not to mention the gleaming eloquence of President Donald J. Trump? And why would those who oppose the mass murder of human beings want to change the subject to deforestation and poison streams and what nuclear weapons do to the planet? But the fact is that if war were moral, legal, defensive, beneficial to the spread of freedom and inexpensive, we would be obliged to make abolishing it our top priority solely because of the destruction that war and preparations for war do as the leading polluters of our natural environment. There's, there's far too many folks in the climate movement right now and far too many organizations that, that are just kind of blindly celebrating the fact that the military is taking climate change seriously. And, and I just saw a headline the other day that said that the military is the only department in our federal government that is taking the threat of climate change seriously. And, and certainly there's, there's some benefit that's uh, coming out of the military connecting some of those dots like between the Syrian war, civil war and, and the climate-induced drought for six years that, that forced one and a half million Syrians off of their farmland and into the cities and exacerbated the, the social tensions that were already there in, clim in, in Syria. And, and they've, they've introduced the, the framing of climate change being a stress multiplier in, in that climate change doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens in a world that is already torn by these existing social tensions of, of militarism and violence and racism and xenophobia. And so, so climate change is not really its own crisis. It's, it's a trigger to the crises that we're already experiencing. So that's a, that's a useful perspective. But it's important to, to be questioning when the military is talking about the importance of, of climate security question what they mean. There's a fantastic book about this called The Secure and the Dispossessed by Nick Buxton. And, and unfortunately, it's one of the most ignored books in the climate movement that, that does ask that question of what the military means when, when they talk about climate security. And what they mean is security for a certain group of people from other people. And generally, they mean security from those people that are most heavily impacted by, by the climate crisis, the people that were already in the most vulnerable and marginalized positions in our society, which is why, since it became increasingly clear that we're not going to stop climate change at a, at a manageable level around 2009 and 2010, 
we've seen an, an explosion of border fences, border walls, between rich and poor countries around the world, not just here, but around the world, particularly um, around the, the border fence that India built almost all the way around Bangladesh. Bangladesh is a country that has 160 million people, half of whom live at less than 10 meters above sea level. And when it became increasingly obvious that, that we were not going to, to stop climate change at a manageable level, the question became, what's gonna to happen to those people? And somewhere, someone made the decision, we're gonna keep them right where they're at. And they built uh, a partially electrified border fence to keep them there. So that, that idea of the military taking climate change seriously means taking these, these threats seriously and further exacerbating the problems that we're already seeing in our society. Whether it's the, the military industrial complex on a global level or whether it's the NRA on a neighborhood level, the profiteers of violence push fear like a gateway drug. But the realities of climate change mean that we have ever increasing reasons for fear. So, so that challenge of disrupting that path from insecurity to war becomes a challenge of pushing back on the narrative of fear and finding other values that we can hold on to, other ways of responding to that insecurity, other ways of responding to conflict, other ways of responding to our fragility. The anti-Vietnam War movement and the women's movement were based very much out of our colleges, but our colleges have been so privatized and corporatized, they're just not the same place at all. So it's not as though we don't have these passions and these values and these visions out there among everyday people that the environment and war are intimately connected. And I would go ahead and assert that, that war and preparing for war inherently destroys the environment and that the destruction of the environment is a driver of conflict and war. And this conference, I think, comes at such a critical time because not only are those two issues kind of going off the charts right now, but also the overarching paradigm here in which these problems exist, that paradigm is collapsing right now before our very eyes. That paradigm of neoliberalism, of militarism, of ruthless exploitation of human and natural resources, this paradigm is failing. Some call this corporatism, some call it end-stage capitalism. Martin Luther King called it the triple threat of racism, militarism, and extreme materialism. But whatever you call it, it adds up to an utter dire necessity for transformative change because we are all in the target hairs. On endless war, as I think um, David mentioned earlier, there is no such thing as a limited nuclear war. And even a regional nuclear war can and is likely to trigger what's called uh, nuclear winter, which is essentially you, you kick up enough dust and debris into the atmosphere, it filters out the sun to a degree that you cannot produce the food that we need, and it's predicted that we will see starvation, mass global starvation, if we have an exchange of even a couple dozen nuclear weapons, which in fact North Korea is in possession of. So I want to just underscore that it's time to really think big. Little changes around the margins are not going to fix this. This is kind of a Hail Mary moment. The uh, darkness is kind of closing in if allowed to continue on its current path, and whether that's nuclear war or whether it's climate change. What's happening on the Korean Peninsula is not an aberration. This is exactly where the system of war, a foreign policy based on economic and military domination, and uh, nuclear weapons takes us. Korea may be the first instance in the modern era of this kind of a conflict, but it's going to happen over and over because non-proliferation doesn't work. More and more countries will have nuclear weapons because it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for some to have the means of basically ruling the world and others not to have. And that was part of the original agreement 
that uh, it was only a temporary measure and we were going to be working diligently towards abolition. And I want to make sure that everybody in the room here in the conference knows that just this week, 51 countries have signed the new nuclear ban treaty that makes nuclear weapons illegal for once and for all. North Korea, as well as Russia, as well as China, have put negotiations on the table and have said that if we will freeze these war rehearsals, they're not war games, they're perfectly serious. They rehearse invasion and decapitation in a climate in which we have been threatening North Korea with a first strike by nuclear weapons for decades. So any regime in their right mind is going to develop nuclear deterrence. Even Dan Coates, director of, the, uh, of uh, national intelligence, said as much himself. What we're facing here is basically deterrence against US uh, nuclear weapons. So if we will all put our weapons down, we can solve this and ensure that we have a future to live with and on, and a planet that we can live on. From, from my perspective, coming out of the climate movement, um, where, where a lot of efforts have been made over the past five to 10 years um, at building a lot of intersectional alliances with other social justice movements, um, and, and the climate movement has worked hard to, to build alliances with the labor movement and the racial justice movement and the immigrant rights movement. Um, and, and hasn't made as much progress, I think, building connections with the peace movement. Um, and, and in fact, I think it has in some ways gone backwards because I think there used to be a, a much stronger connection um, in, in the heyday of the anti-nuclear movement. Um, and, when, and when David and, and Leah um, came up to me about a, a month or so ago in Minneapolis um, at, at a different conference and, and asked me, um, like, about, about that disconnect between the peace movement and the environmental movement. Um, my first reaction was, um, like, well, we're both too white. Like, <laughs> that's, I think that's why the climate movement doesn't reach out as much to the peace movement, um, because the whiteness of the, the environmental movement um, is, is a big shame of the movement. It's, it's the thing that the movement is most ashamed of about itself. Um, and one of the things that strategically has held it back from being more effective. Um, and and we, when we look at the, the peace movement, um, we see a movement that looks too much like ourselves. Um, and so, you know, I think a weird thing that both of us, that both of our movements need to do to build alliances with each other is also become more diverse within ourselves um, and, and be more inclusive movements. One of the ways we become more diverse is by addressing social and racial justice issues because it's very hard for people who are being really thrown under the bus to do more than fight the survival issues. In South Korea, they began as an anti-corruption movement and a pro-democracy movement and from there you know, and they were based on the whole progressive agenda. But that was really the focus around which people came together. I saw them gather by the riverside And all together a soulful cry And some were bold and some were faint Saying if war is normal
Turns out it's a good thing Anyway, it's how you made You can thrash and turn away But you can't let that part go One thing you can do I'm gonna lay down my sword and shield Down by the riverside Down by the riverside Down by the riverside I'm gonna lay down my sword and shield Down by the riverside I'm gonna study that war no more I ain't gonna study war no more I Ain't gonna study war no more I Ain't gonna study Before the nuclear test ban treaty was finally signed in 1963, the U.S. and the USSR together had unleashed 1,352 underground nuclear blasts, 520 atmospheric detonations, and eight subsea explosions, and a couple in near space, uh, equal to the force of 36,400 Hiroshima-grade bombs. In 2002, the National Cancer Institute warned that everyone on Earth had been exposed to fallout levels from these uh, atmospheric explosions, and they had already at that point caused tens of thousands of cancer deaths. In the closing decades of the 20th century, the military horror show is unrelenting. For 37 months, in the early 1950s, the United States pounded North Korea with 635,000 tons of bombs and 32,557 tons of napalm the U.S. destroyed 78 Korean cities, 5,000 schools, 1,000 hospitals, 600,000 homes, and killed as, perhaps as many as 9 million people, which would be 30% of the, of the population by some estimates. So Pyongyang has good reason to fear the U.S. In 1991, the U.S. dropped 88,000 tons of bombs on Iraq, destroying homes, power plants, major dam dams, water supplies, triggering a health emergency that contributed to the deaths of half a million Iraqi children. Smoke from Kuwait's burning oil fields turned, night, turned day to night and released vast plumes of toxic soot that drifted downwind for hundreds of miles. From 1992 to 2007, U.S. bombing helped destroy 38% of the forest habitat in Afghanistan. In 1999, NATO's bombing of a petrochemical plant in Yugoslavia sent clouds of deadly chemicals into the sky and released tons of pollution into nearby rivers. Africa's Rwandan war drove nearly 750,000 people into the Virunga National Park. 105 square miles were ransacked and 35 square miles were stripped bare. In Sudan, feeding soldiers, fleeing soldiers and civilians spilled into Garamba National Park, decimating the animal population. And in the Democratic Republic of Congo, armed conflict reduced the resident elephant population from 22,000 to a mere 5,000. During the 2003 invasion of Iraq, the Pentagon spread more than 1,000 tons of radioactive depleted uranium over the land triggering an epidemic of cancers and a generation of horrifically deformed children in Fallujah and other cities. When asked what triggered the Iraq War, former CENTCOM Commander General John Ebizade was quite candid. He admitted, of course, it's about oil. We can't really deny that. And here's the awful truth. The Pentagon needs to fight wars for oil to fight wars for oil. Wherever go the stricken soul the white Those wounded in the flesh or in the mind Where illness is the order and death is always nigh Wherever go the stricken soul go white Wherever go the rootless, so go I. The refugee and wandering exile. Wherever legs are weary from endless dreadful.
for miles Wherever go the rootless, so go I I want to recommend a book that I've been hoping would someone would publish for a decade and more, and that's The War and Environment Reader, which will be in press or in bookstores within a month. As Gar has highlighted, it's an old story. It's as old as organized human societies. But in our educational system, the many-sided connections between warfare and its environmental costs hardly show up at any level. Environmental historians paid little attention to these connections until our war and environment network emerged less than a decade ago. Most of us didn't want to study military history. Military historians, in contrast, have always paid attention to the national world, natural world, as settings and shapers of military operations and mass conflict, but their work has rarely discussed the long environmental legacies of military operations. Many peace studies programs could be enriched also by more attention to the environmental dimensions. Farm populations have regularly suffered severely in wartime as military columns sweep across the land, requisitioning supplies, burning buildings, destroying crops, and damaging landscapes. These campaigns escalated with the coming of industrial warfare in the 19th century. The American Civil War is an obvious example. Scorched earth campaigns also produced agricultural disruptions and severe mal civilian malnutrition in almost every region of Europe in the Middle East in World War I. Counterinsurgency campaigns designed to cripple civilian support of insurgents have repeatedly caused deliberate environmental damage. The use of chemical weapons in Vietnam was derived in part from colonial war strategies of the British and the French, who in turn had studied American strategy in the conquest of the Philippines around 1900. Many wartime upheavals have caused mass refugee movements. In modern times, they're usually well reported, except for the environmental dimension. Environmental stress intensifies wherever people are forced to leave, and also along their escape routes, and also where they land and have to struggle for survival. The military's contribution to global warming has a history. But it hasn't yet been studied systematically. Barry Sanders' powerful book, The Green Zone, I'm glad oh, it was mentioned last evening, is an important example of very careful work on this. 2015, the, we're all sort of talking about how do we stop uranium mining in northern Quebec? Because this is a big issue. What we were able to do with people like bringing together peace activists, environmentalists, mining, anti-mining groups, anti, um, we had the Cree, the Inu, Inu of Northern Quebec, we had three major councils of Inuit, we had the youth from the Inuit, we brought together the World Uranium Symposium and had more than 300 people in Quebec. Now, and we brought through a declaration that linked uranium mining, nuclear power, nuclear weapons, and all through it was the question of the environment. So is there a difference between environmentalists and peace activists? I think the, my two uh, previous speakers have really outlined very well that we're on the same page. And perhaps the only reason we don't see it or that we're separating them at all is it that we're letting the media separate us. Depleted uranium is another place where we are inextricably linked because there is no dividing line between the environment and war in that matter. Depleted uranium is uranium-238, 
and according to the U.S. Department of Defense and the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, it is only slightly radioactive and it is only toxic if consumed in large amounts. That's actually, that's probably true. Except that uranium-238 is radioactive. What does radioactive mean? It means that it inexorably, and that word means can't do anything else. It has to decay. And it decays into radium, radon, responsible for practically 20% of our lung cancers, and polonium-210 the most toxic substance on earth and uh, the, about a, the amount of a pinhead is what killed Litvinenko um, in uh, the UK. Great stretches of land in Iraq, Bosnia, Libya and Syria have been polluted with it. What I learned in school and university was that humans were essentially competitive, that nature was survival of the fittest, and that life wasn't always fair, and that war was part of human nature. These premises are, allow us to make pre prejudice, racism, unethical deeds, if you don't get caught, domination, and the making of war okay. There have always been wars, we've been told. Well, David, in his book, uh, puts the death to that particular myth. Even if it were true, what kind of excuse is it? Dental abscesses, arthritis, common cold, and cancer have also always been with us. But that has not prevented us from devoting great amounts of energy and time to prevent, treat, or cure them. When we first started planning the World Uranium Symposium, the Mining Watch people were really opposed to the idea of including um, nuclear weapons and, and war as part of that uh, symposium. At the end of the symposium, because they got all their speakers, <laughs> We got their speakers on as well. So Camp Minden, for years, for decades, was a, a U.S. Army depot. And on, next slide, that's, it's 15,000 acres uh, situated between I-20 and U.S. 80. Uh, Minden, the town of Minden, is the upper, upper left, uh, the upper right of the, of the photograph there. Uh, but it's fairly sparsely populated up there. These are people, I mean, they, they live not far off the Barksdale base, strong support for the military there. Uh, Shreveport was trying to get a cybersecurity uh, center established there, uh, built a building, got some cyber stuff going on there, but some other community actually won it. But it's a, high, a level of high patriotism. Uh, you know, the military is their friend. That's the way this was viewed. Uh, next slide. So on the night of October 15th in 2012, something major happened. There was a major explosion. At first, people thought maybe it was a meteor, maybe it was an earthquake. This is the National Weather Service uh, report on it. The, it was an explosion from Camp Minden. Uh, the plume uh, showed up on radar, <laughs> National Weather Service radar, for about 40 minutes. Uh, people weren't sure what, what had happened, though. The next day, Louisiana State Police go out and some... Uh, the Webster Parish Sheriff's Department goes out and it turns out there was an explosion there. There are actually a couple of explosions. The U.S. Department of Defense had contracted with a company called Explo Services that was supposed to be disposing of what turns out to be about 16 million pounds of propellant and munitions that had been stored there. Well, they were bringing it from different parts of the country, but they were not disposing of it. They were just stacking it there. It was stacked in bunkers. It sprawled out, if you can... It, this is outside of bunkers, outside of buildings. It was everywhere. It was just like, if you think about it, 15,000 acres, 16 million pounds, that's over 1,000 pounds per acre of explosives scattered around there. Well, shortly after this explosion, uh, you know, people are asking questions explo about Explo Services. Explo Services declares bankruptcy and tries to walk away from it. And uh, the, the people... Uh, who ran Explo Services uh, were indicted and convicted of fraud and uh, have gone to prison, but it still left 16 million pounds of munitions, highly unstable. There were a couple of other smaller explosions that happened after that. 
uh, but a couple of, you know, 16 million pounds of explosives. So the Army had a clear and easy plan approved by EPA Region 6. We're just going to burn it all in the open air. We'll, we're going we're to do about 80,000 pounds a day, and where it goes, nobody knows. Uh, next slide, please. So what happened was really amazing. There was a spontaneous grassroots movement that sprang up in northwest Louisiana among these patriots who otherwise would never question anything the military did. Dr. Brian Salvatore uh, is a chemistry professor at LSU Shreveport. And he immediately re recognized what would happen if you started burning these, uh, these quantities of uh, propellant and munitions, uh, at, again, over a 200-day period, about 80,000 pounds a day, what, what would the likely impact be? And the winds would blow any, anywhere. Uh, so he sort of sounded the first sound of the alarm and spoke out against it. And this uh, concerned citizens of Camp Menden sprung up. It's uh, Frances Kelly, who is a Shre lives in Shreveport, she's an activist, and she really spearheaded this aggressive grassroots campaign that turned this thing around. And they actually ended up forcing uh, the, the Defense Department, the EPA, the state of Louisiana, because the state of Louisiana, the Nat Louisiana National Guard now actually has control of the base, uh, and got them to go through great expense to do a control burn, a high impact burn, a high pr pressure burn that was much cleaner than open, an open air burn where, you know, but we're not sure exactly how much cleaner it was because they didn't do that level of monitoring. So, but there were, there were daily action calls. We were calling Gina McCarthy. We were calling uh, our, our U.S. senators, our congressmen, the governor's office, EPA Region 6. It was just real methodical. Every day there was actions. Here's what you do. Here's who you call. If you want a script, here's a script. And again, they went through huge expense to get a, this burn unit. Next slide, please. These are useful idiots. Uh, David, David Vitter was our senator at the time. He was running for governor. Uh, John Fleming was the congressman from that era. He was running for the Senate the next year. Uh, both of them uh, fierce ideological opponents of the idea of protecting the environment or the EPA. But what, what Brian and, and, and Francis and the activists there were able to do was turn the, their anti-EPA uh, sentiment of these two guys into advocates for them to change the plan to go from open burn to some kind of control burn. So it's a neat little bit of political jujitsu that took place again with these two guys and the, the, the activists were really, you know, uh, they didn't pull the wool over their eyes but they used their, their hostility in a, in a creative way. Uh, the F-35 is capable of dropping nuclear bombs. And with its stealth coating, or the, the whole body is coated with this material that uh, absorbs radar. So it can penetrate foreign airspace with its bombs without being detected. It can sneak in and do a first attack and uh, blast people uh, without being uh, attacked, uh, without being detected. And, uh, Vermont Senator Patrick Leahy, uh, he's the most senior senator in the entire U.S. Senate, is really the driving force for uh, bringing in the F-35. We have our governor, our previous governor, our congressman, and yes, Bernie Sanders, all are ardent supporters of basing the F-35 fighter bomber in South Burlington, Vermont. Uh, it's not just uh, Ben and Jerry who oppose F-35 basing, and they've been very active in the campaign, especially Ben. Uh, the next slide, please. We have a, ro a retired Air Force colonel uh, named Roseanne Greco. Oh, maybe it's the next slide. Yeah, there she is. You might notice who she's with in that picture. She did quite a bit of work with Colin Powell uh, when she was in the Air Force. And she, uh, when she was chair of the South Burlington City Council, she did an independent investigation of uh, the effects of F-35 basing, uh, and F-16 basing, actually, uh, on Vermont. And uh, she became a very strong opponent 
of basing it at the airport, which is lo actually located in South Burlington. And uh, she stepped down from the council and is now providing a tremendous leadership uh, to, to the campaign to stop F-35 basing in Vermont. And that campaign has been intense for the last seven years, since 2010, when the idea of F-35 basing in Vermont first was announced. Uh, as, and that Burlington might be one of three choices for the being the first air guard station where it would be based. We've had, for the seven years, picket lines and demonstrations. We've had mass protests at Senator Leahy's office, marches, rallies. We had a big debate. We actually got it on the ballot and uh, won the vote in the neighboring city of Winooski, which is one mile from the end of the runway, and, and all the planes taking off, uh, going north, go right over Winooski. Uh, and a, the vast majority of people voted to stop the F-35. Uh, and so we've had all these campaigns. We've uh, gotten the city councils of South Burlington and Winooski to vote against F-35 basing. We've had big town meetings about the health effects. One is the intense noise of these fighter bombers. And the other, another is the high risk of a crash of an F-35 jet and the high consequences when it does crash. Another is that basing military weapons that, like this, offensive military weapons makes all the thousands of families living in working class affordable homes around the airport into human shields, which is illegal. And then there's the loss of housing, affordable housing, and I'll, t I'll go into that in a moment. And then there's the last one, is this, this governance of the airport where Burlington owns the airport and it's located in South Burlington. So all the elected officials um, that make the decisions about the airport, we don't have accountable government. And that's a provision of our Vermont Constitution. It's a stronger provision uh, than we have in our U.S. Constitution, that you must have an accountable government to the people. There you go. Cut that. No. I came to talk about that plume of smoke loaded with lead particulate matter. Children are being poisoned through their participation in the Junior Reserve Officer Training Corps Marksmanship Program in the high schools. Air gun rifles used in high schools across the country discharge lead at the muzzle end of the firing line and at the target. J. Razzi officials feel it's unnecessary to clean their guns regularly. That's because every pellet being fired down the barrel scrapes out the deposits of lead from the pellets that went before. In fact, the manual on standard operating procedures published by the J. Rotsi Cadet Command says it's recommended to clean rifles every 1,000 to 2,000 shots. You look at this third slide, it's extremely telling. You can actually see the lead particulate matter from the muzzle end of an air rifle. They're in our classrooms. They take biology classrooms, and they're, they're, they're in our gyms, in Montgomery County, in Fairfax County, and in Washington, D.C., and across the country. Slide four, please. You remember Ralphie? Well, the rifle that Ralphie got for Christmas um, it was a Daisy uh, Red Rider, and it, it shoots little steel pellets or BBs at 350 feet per second. Okay, you can run that. Crossman, uh, the pellet. pellet pellets, uh, 1.77 uh, caliber, and um, I just want to open them up, kind of get a look. I don't want to touch it, but you can sort of see the lead um, uh, residue at the bottom. Perhaps pull it out like that. And uh, move some of this stuff over. And that is lead residue right there. 
and it's a mess and the kids are putting their fingers in here and God only knows how much they're ingesting. Thank you. A German study found that 20 individuals who shot only air guns showed a median blood level of 33 micrograms per deciliter. The journal Environmental Health reports that air gun shooters, after an indoor shooting session, had blood lead levels of 8.4 micrograms of lead per deciliter, with some as high as 22.2. Demler and Nowak, writing in the International Archives of Occupational and Environmental Health, also documented high blood levels in indoor air gun shooters. A Swedish study looked at the air in an indoor firing range that was used exclusively for air guns and found that the air had levels an average of 4.6 micrograms per cubic meter. The EPA has established an air quality standard for lead at 1.5 micrograms per cubic meter. That's three times the level. We have a big problem. No one's paying attention about, to it because no one knows anything about it. Regularly firing lead projectiles indoors at 500 feet per second in programs involving 1,600 public high schools is insane public policy. We're the only nation on earth to allow such lunacy. It should be noted that the Young Marines is open to all children from third grade up. These children love firing weapons. When schools across the country don't use their own classrooms and gyms for shooting ranges, they go to places like this. We, were very, we weren't very cautious, said one kid. We would get lead on our hands and eat finger food. Investigators found the ventilation failed to move the airborne lead particles downrange away from the shooters. Children inhaled lead, ate lead, absorbed lead, through skin contact and dirty surfaces. In 2013, a group of us in Montgomery County, Maryland, approached district officials regarding our concerns for lead exposure in regular classrooms, biology classrooms, algebra classrooms, um, you know, classrooms, uh, PE classrooms. You know the kind of classrooms where you have the curtain in between? They just open them up, fourth period, bring in the guns. Fairfax County, Virginia was a different story. They were confronted by another group of, of determined, organized parents. Unlike Montgomery, Fairfax immediately took action. Once the central office became aware of the firing ranges, they didn't even know they existed. It resonates through every land in a language we all understand. Our voices will reverberate ship frequencies and soon the new millennium will start here inside the peace room in the peace room there's room for all we share our stories hear our call creativity's exchanged no one can enter and not feel changed it's walls extend beyond our sight into a field of endless light where deepest, highest aspirations move. Step inside. Step inside. Peace, peace room. room. Welcome to the peace room. And thanks for being here. Thank you so much. So at Food and Water Watch, we originally um, worked on fighting factory farms and the corporate food system that made it really hard for farmers to make a fair living and for people to have access to healthy food. We also, on the water side, I've done a lot of work on the water, opposed water privatization and advocated for um, increased funding of our water and sewer system so that people have access to safe drinking water and don't have the issues that we see now in, in Flint, Michigan and, and in places where people can't afford their water from shutoffs and everything else. Um, 
But we, you know, it kind of shows how these issues are connected, how we evolved over time. In about 2008 and 2009, we started receiving a lot of calls on the water program, which I was working in, from people in Pennsylvania and New York who were worried about fracking, contaminating their drinking water. And at the time, we weren't really working a lot on energy issues, but started doing some research and realized how dangerous this new era of extraction was, how little research there was on it, and how it was exempt from federal regulations, including the Safe Drinking Water Act. So the Defense Department consumed almost 86 million barrels of fuel in 2016, the single, larger, the single largest consumer of fossil fuels, um, ensuring tremendous profit for the oil and gas industry. Many of the effects of climate change, such as drought and famine, will be the sources of conflicts in the future. And um, you know, as we militarize and and um, you know prioritize, we prioritize that in the recent budget. I'm sure many of you followed the that the Senate just passed 80 billion dollars for the military. And you know, as we make these choices about how we spend the taxpayer dollars, it's it's you know. It, we're not choosing what's best for the public good when we're choosing to make those types of investment in the military. Um, we did some quick calculations, and this increase in just the increase in military spending could be applied to renewable energy and would power 887,000 homes with solar or over a million homes with wind power. And so the movement against extreme fossil fuels and against climate change and for environmental justice intersects with the, the peace movement. I live and work on Jagera and Turbul country in Mianjin, what is known as Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. Regions in which I work and live are affected already by climate change to such an extent that climate mitigation and migration are the daily life reality with sea level rise forcing some people off their ancestral lands while others have already been displaced, disfigured, or destroyed by nuclear testing and ongoing militarization of their homelands and seas. Sovereignty of those lands has never been ceded. Australia shares the legacy of colonization, nuclearization, and militarization with her neighbors in the Pacific, and with the United States. This is a picture of almost exactly 50 years ago today, uh, peace, anti-nuclear, and civil liberties and Aboriginal rights uh, protesters reclaiming a street in Brisbane. Um, this was the beginning of the uh, long-term marches against the Vietnam War and the intersection of the uranium campaigns and the peace campaigns in Australia with the, with this right, um, with the Aboriginal land rights movement. Where I grew up in Texas and later in Washington and Virginia, we rarely heard the studies of those regions as histories of invasion, colonization, or dispossession. When we studied slavery, we rarely associated the brutality of the past with trauma and disadvantage in the present. When I taught modern history in an Australian school, History started with the Industrial Revolution and basically consisted of World War I, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. That's true. European and American-involved wars were the markers of time. Frontier wars were never considered. Aboriginal people in Australia die young, often live in poverty, are disproportionately represented in prisons, foster care systems, and in suicide rates, and are un under constant pressure to barter their culture and connection to country or land for promised improvement of living conditions that urban Australians take for granted. In 1976, when the Ranger uranium mine was proposed and now in what is now the World Heritage listed Kakadu National Park, the local traditional owners, the Mirar people, consistently rejected the mine. The government invoked the National Interest Clause and the mine was approved. The uranium mine brought with it services that the community did not have until then, electricity. Yes, electricity. This community did not have electricity, a health care center, or a school until they had a uranium mine on their traditional lands. Now, with the closure of the mine in sight, there is uncertainty about whether those services will remain in their community, though the toxic legacy of uranium tailings will remain for thousands of years. Uranium from the Ranger mine was used by TEPCO 
in the Fukushima nuclear reactors. The Mirar people feel responsible for poison coming from their country and continue to oppose the mining and export of uranium. The nuclear weapons and waste cycles start in Australia with uranium mining. Australia has had nuclear, uh, uranium agreements with every nuclear weapon state. Australia has been a testing ground for British nuclear weapons, and now Australia fuels a nuclear arms race with its loyalty to the US uh, military nuclear umbrella. Our campaigns for environmental justice and our calls for peace are inextricably linked to justice and sovereignty of First Nations people. Every two years, Australia hosts some of the world's largest military operations, Exercise Talisman Saber, joint U.S. combined force training which sees thousands of personnel engaged in land, sea, and air maneuvers, live firing, bombing practice, the use of sonar, onshore landings, nuclear-powered and nuclear weapons-capable vessels. With support locations in cities around the country, the majority of the action takes place oh. Um, in Queensland, on and around the Great Barrier Reef, in the Northern Territory, the Coral Sea, the Arafura Sea, and the Timor Seas. Um, it, was in the, it was in the early 1990s, and I came to learn about the, the leadership and the personality and the movement that Ken Sarawiwa represented of the Agoni people in Nigeria, struggling and fighting with the Dutch Royal Shell Company and, and struggling for protection of the legacies and the protection of the people of Nigeria, the Agoni people of Nigeria, that were being detrimentally impacted by the oil extraction industry there in Nigeria. It is something that was going on then, had been going on for decades then, and is continuing even to this day. But I, I want to remember Ken. As, as I begin to talk about the challenge of combining movements globally, the challenge of combining movements globally, because this is something that is rooted in history and we can draw upon some examples, but one of the things that we also have to draw upon is that in order to do this effectively, we're going to have to lean into positions of discomfort. We're going to have to accept some things that may not be easy to accept. We are going to have to suffer some things in terms of, of, of our privilege if we are to begin to discover and uncover and embrace answers that answer and solutions that solve. In Anniston, Alabama, they were, they were attempting at the time to locate a, a chemical weapons incinerator right near where Monsanto Chemical Company also happened to, to be located, right near the fence line where there was a black and brown community that lived right there and there were children and there were women who were, who were dealing with levels of cancer, levels of, 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 of physical destruction that was directly tied to the toxic contamination that was being spewed into the water into their air, into the soil, into the places where they lived and where they worked and where they played. And so we saw that, 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 that intersection. We see the relationship. We must see the relationship. That we cannot truly be talking about saving this earth if we are not talking about saving the people of this earth. How do we speak? How do we communicate? How do we publish? How do we share information that is available to people who do not speak English as their first language? This is a critically important challenge to combining our movements. Not to mention that while we're tempted to increase our reliance on the military to solve problems like refugee crises and conflicts, um, the Pentagon is one of the biggest consumers of fossil fuels in the world. Um, in 2015, the Pentagon spent $7 billion on petroleum-based propellants and fuels. And I drive a Toyota Corolla, and that would be enough for me to fill up for the next 4.3 million years. Um, this is our discretionary federal spending. It's a little over a trillion dollars. Um, and the biggest, by far, chunk of it is for military spending. That blue chunk, um, more than half of the pie, at 56% now in fiscal year 2017, um, and possibly about to rise, $659 billion. Um, and if you add to that federal spending on 
militarization here at home on incarceration and policing and deportations and raids and border security, you easily get up to about 65%. So that leaves only one in three discretionary dollars for everything else, including changing our energy sources. That's the part of the budget that has uh, renewable energy programs. That's the part of the budget that has um, research into new technologies and renewable energies. That's where that money can come from. And there's only one in three discretionary dollars available. And that has to compete with education and with veterans benefits and with housing programs and with so many other things, just one in three federal dollars are available for. So we need to move the money. We spend 28 times more on our military than we do fighting climate change. Likewise, over the next 30 years, the U.S. wants to spend a trillion dollars upgrading our new nuclear arsenal, starting a new nuclear arms race. That money, if we reinvested it in utility-grade solar power, could power every household in the United States four times over. And one key to unlock that is about jobs. Um, there is a huge reliance by the military and military contractors on their economic benefits in communities. Um, they take that to Congress, they take it to local communities, they take it to local leaders, and then they cash it in. Um, and that's what we have to do with climate change. This is a screenshot from the official website for the F-35 jet fighter. Um, and you can go here and you can find your own state and it'll tell you, oh, whoops. It'll tell you how many, um, how many locations there are, how many direct and indirect jobs there are, um, which for any of you who are uh, at all familiar with economic impact analysis, it means they're taking credit not just for the jobs where they actually employ people, but for the jobs that are created when those employees go to the mall in their local community. So they're just claiming credit for everything. Um, and then they tell you the, the total economic impact. And they have this for every state. In our government, representatives of both parties fall for this. And we can convert existing facilities and workforces in pilot communities from military work to clean energy work. And this is an idea that's been explored in a few commun communities, and it hasn't come to fruition much yet, but it's something that needs to continue, we need to continue to push, and we need successful pilot cases for that. Everything the U.S. military does today is coordinated and directed by space technology. So no matter whether it's a ship uh, in the ocean, troops on the ground, uh, airplanes, missiles flying, everything is coordinated by U.S. satellites and ground stations all over the planet. And in all these places around the world where these downlink stations are built by the U.S., there are peace groups in those communities saying, we don't want a component of the U.S. Star Wars program in our community, and that is essentially the membership of the global network. So I invite you to take our newsletter and check it out. Let me start with this question. I think, I think I'm going to guess that you are all going to know the answer to it. What's the U.S.'s number one industrial export product today? That's right. And when weapons are your number one industrial export product, what is your global marketing strategy for that product line? Years ago, during the Bush II administration, I was watching C-SPAN one evening. And it's a huge auditorium here in Washington. A lot of people, military brass uniforms, and they said a lot of CIA people were in the audience, hundreds of them. And the speaker was Thomas Barnett, who was uh, the author of a new book called The Pentagon's New Map. And he was introduced as Donald Rumsfeld's strategy guy. Well, I ran and got a, a, a notepad and listened to his three-hour presentation. And if you go online uh, on YouTube and Google Thomas Barnett, Pentagon's New Map, 
uh, it's very instructive what he had to say. Basically, he said that under corporate globalization of the world economy, every different country is going to have a different role, a different job. And he said, our job in the United States will be security export. Okay, and that's what we are today, which translates to me endless war. And so the only way we're going to get out from behind this eight ball is conversion of the military industrial complex. Most peace groups made a tragic mistake of giving up on the issue because, because it wasn't popular anymore. And folks moved on to more immediate fires to put out. But activists should have kept on message, still opposing these new wars, but also integrating the conversion message into the what can we do part of their toolbox. We can't just keep saying no, we need a yes, a positive transformative vision to share with the public as well. Just, just last weekend, four of us wearing these Maine Natural Guard t-shirts went to the Sierra Club statewide conference on climate change in Lewiston, Maine, and we split up and attended as many of the workshops as we could, flyering people about this uh, Maine Peace Walk, showing the connection between the military, uh, which has the largest carbon boot print on the planet, and climate change. And we got a decent response, uh, and we were very happy about that. I want to start with a, a little bit of a commercial interruption before we start our panel. Uh, and um, I want to bring your attention to this wonderful book uh, that was in your packages today. This is uh, World Beyond Wars, A Global Security System, An Alternative to War. It's not just another brochure for you to take home. Uh, this was developed, uh, this edition, 2017 edition, our third edition. Uh, was revised and developed by David Swanson and Patrick Hiller uh, with the input of several of you in this audience uh, as well as other members of the World Beyond War community. And I just want to point out how, how important this, this book is. Um, this book is World Beyond War's attempt um, to provide analysis of the war system. We've got that pretty much figured out. Um, an outline of an alternative global security system. Um, one that's uh, where peace is pursued by peaceful means, what we're trying to explore and achieve today. Um, but this isn't just an outline uh, of some, some new radical visions. This contains proven nonviolent alternatives to war, components of a real peace system. Um, and this also contains World Beyond the War's proposed strategy for establishing this new system and for accelerating the development of the cultures of peace that already exist within our world and our communities. Um, and I just want to point out that this, um, this is a work in progress. This is, again, our third edition. It's a living document. We intend to be updating it every year. Uh, and you are the first recipients of this book. Uh, it will be live uh, and for sale on our website very shortly. Um, but the reason I come to World Beyond War, I should introduce myself. I'm, I'm Tony Jenkins. I'm the education coordinator from, for World Beyond War. Uh, and my background in context and work has always been in peace education and peace studies. And the reason I came to World Beyond War was the motivation that this book brought, this book brought to me. Um, I'm deeply inspired by the vision of creating this alternative new system, and that's always been part of my own teaching work. And as Dale Dewar reminded us this morning, change the story, change the future. That's what this book has the potential to do, and that's why we, we continue to work on it. Um, another one of my heroes, uh, sociologist and peace researcher and peace educator, Elise Boulding, always would say, we can't work for a world we can't imagine. And that's what this book also helps us to do. So the substance of this book can help us in that direction. This book, we've been told by many people, is insanely dense and complex, uh, maybe intimidatingly so for some of you, but is it more scary to read this um, than to stare down um, nuclear apocalypse, right? I think it's something we can handle. It's pretty reasonable to get through the 120 or so pages of this book. Um, we firmly believe that this should be, and no, not should be, must be required reading. 
in high schools, in social studies classes, in university-based peace studies program, graduate and undergraduate, in community groups and religious groups, uh, and uh, dare I say it, in the US Congress. If I may actually start with a further add to the commercial for this uh, amazing uh, program. The cover story, the, the cover picture for this is actually by a former South African conscientious objector who left South Africa in 1983 as a 19-year-old cameraman and who is now a film producer in Hollywood. Uh, but I was organizing a conference for War Resisters International in Cape Town in 2014 and was introduced to Ralph Zeman, and you'll see it's mentioned here that he, that he did the cover. And uh, the, the, the logo for War Resisters International was a broken rifle. He said, well, I can do a broken AK-47 and wrap it in US dollar bills uh, to symbolize the war industry. And um, we were holding the conference in the, Cape, the old Cape Town City Hall, so we arranged to have a 120-meter wheat paste image, the biggest wheat paste image in the world, pasted onto the parade in front of the Cape Town City Hall and the Cape Town Main, li main Library. So this picture you have is actually taken from a drone, uh, hence the perspective of it. And, um, it was, it was uh, there for six weeks before it was um, uh, steam, steamed off, but um, Ralph and I are now talking about having a permanent um, um, sculpture of this, hoping to raise the money for a sculpture five meters by two meters. Um, hopefully we'll have one in Cape Town, but maybe you would like one in Washington as well. <laughs> South Africa in the, in the mid-1980s. We are on the way to civil war. And the sanctions campaign was really the last non-violent hope that we could avert that civil war. Thank God it worked. Um, South Africa is really the only instance where sanctions have worked, unlike, for instance, the US example with Cuba since the 1950s, or when Marilyn Albright tried to justify uh, the deaths of 500,000 Iraqi children, saying she thought it was worth it. So South Africa really remains, despite many times when sanctions have been used, sanctions have worked because we targeted the banks, primarily. One thing leads to the other, boycotts, conscientize people, Divestment also conscientizes and has impact, and I'll come back to that, but we targeted the banks, and in particular, the seven major New York banks, because of the role of the US dollar uh, as settlement currency in foreign exchange markets. If you didn't have access to those ma seven major banks, you couldn't trade with Europe or Japan or wherever. And because of Archbishop Tutu's network, uh, we were able to prevail on the mainline churches here to pressure their bankers. Uh, the Episcopalians uh, threatened Morgan Guarantee and Bank of New York. The um, Catholics um, threatened Manufacturers Hanover, and the Presbyterians ha uh, uh, threatened um, Chemical Bank. And the deal was, do you want our pension fund business or the business of apartheid South Africa? You make a choice. And when David Dinkins came into office, uh, he added the payroll account for the city of New York, or apartheid South Africa. And to our own astonishment, President George Bush Sr. added his voice to it, to our astonishment. Um, and in October 1989, we had five points we kept pushing uh, as part of our agenda. The end of the state of emergency, release political prisoners, unban political organizations. Uh, four was uh, repeal of apartheid legislation, and five was uh, constitutional negotiations for a non-racial democracy. And in October 89, uh, we had the March for Peace in Cape Town in September 89. In October 89, um, um, President Bush Sr.'s uh, Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs issued an ultimatum uh, to the South African government to comply with the first three of our conditions by February 1990, and that was included the release of Nelson Mandela. Uh, and it was another four years of tough negotiations, but. Uh, Eventually, we, we overcame the apartheid system and avoided a racial bloodbath. Uh, right after 94, the European governments put massive pressure on us to buy weapons with the story that you spend $5 billion on warships and warplanes we don't need, and they'll invest back $18 billion in offsets. Offsets is simply vehicles to pay bribes. 
And when I first heard about the bribes, I asked the British government to investigate where, why BAE, or British Aerospace, was laundering bribes through two Swedish trade unions. Scotland Yard was appointed to investigate, and it came back. It was not illegal in English law to bribe foreigners, and therefore there was no crime to investigate. That was 98. We've made progress. For people who think we are not making progress, we've made progress. The man who actually laundered the bribes is now the Prime Minister of Sweden. <laughs> Anyway, we're here to talk about Israel, really, and divestment. Um, I, since uh, in 2009-2010, I was a peace monitor in, uh, at the checkpoints in Jerusalem and then Bethlehem. Um, and then uh, when the Russell Tribunal on Palestine met in Cape Town in 2011, uh, I was the local organizing secretary when we brought 30 witnesses to uh, discuss whether Israeli um, conduct towards Palestinians meets the cri legal criteria of apartheid as a, a crime against humanity. And as South Africans, we say bad as apartheid was in, in South Africa, it is far, far worse in Israel-Palestine. We never had apartheid roads, apartheid walls, and the security, the, the, the permit system yeah, is way beyond what we had, uh, let alone um, the, the targeting of people through drones in Gaza. And Gaza is now on the verge of, you, you can call it genocide, two million people facing genocide in, in Gaza. It's a, it's a terrible situation. I was back in, in Palestine um, in, in June with my wife. Uh, for, we were a group of about 20 people, 20 internationals, invited to meet the BDS committee in Ramallah and, and Nablus, and also the Israeli Coalition of, of Women for, for Peace in Tel Aviv. And the decision there was that we should be focusing on the Israeli armaments industry. Uh, and in particular, in Elbert. Elbert provide, produces uh, most of the drones in Israel. It accounts for almost half of Israel's arms exports of six and a half billion dollars per year. Israel is now exporting weapons to 130 countries, including Myanmar. Uh, we in South Africa are particularly concerned about the consequences, for instance, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where the Israeli armaments industry keeps the Kabila dictatorship in, our, in, in office. They provide the security, the weapons, against which they uh, get concessions to plunder the natural resources in the Congo, the coltan, the copper, the cobalt, the diamonds, the gold, the timber, oil. Um, and they launder the proceeds through the banking system back into the Israeli economy. Um, the situation is known in the Congo as Africa's First World War. What we need is those major movements fighting for social security, fighting for health care, fighting for education, to recognize that the only way they're going to get those campaigns, what they need, is to cut the military budget. Now, taxing billionaires would help too. You pr probably have to do both. So, um, in our Massachusetts Peace Action nuclear disarming campaign, we're very clear. We start off with the social need. Build housing, not bombs. Subways, not submarines. Healthcare, not warfare. And we don't invite the housing activists to come for our, to our meetings, because they won't. They're in a crisis over losing their housing, right? We try to go to their meetings and say, well, with you, why in the wealthiest country on earth isn't there enough money for housing? It's because they're building nuclear weapons. People, listen, and if you get to show Lindsay's slide, right, people are blown away. I cannot tell you how many times I've put that slide up there, said half of the U.S. budget goes to weapons and is your tax dollars, and people say, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I'm an educated person. If that was true, I would know that. Right? You'll notice that no agency of the United States government, not the Congress, not the executive branch, not the IRS, writes back to you how your tax dollars are being spent. Everybody talks about paying income taxes, and nobody has a clue about how that money is spent. In Cambridge, a city manager sends you a glossy booklet how did they spend your property taxes? How much for schools? How much for fire? How much for police? Everybody reads it. I'm telling you, if the American people knew that more than half of their tax dollars was going to weapons, they'd have a little different uh, attitude toward it. 
Now, among this, these web, among this enormous budget, buried in there because of secrecy, is the nuclear weapons uh, pro program. Uh, the uh, Congressional Budget Office estimates over the next 10 years maybe 300 or $350 billion on nuclear weapons. And you've heard that the administration is proposing this totally insane program of spending a trillion dollars over the next 30 years, a thousand billion dollars on nuclear weapons. Due to the good work of Susie and her colleagues, we know the corporations that manufacture nuclear weapons and maintain them. There aren't that many. She says 27, but if you leave out the ones in Italy and India, it's about 20 in the US. If you want to know how come there's 99% and 1%, so taxes over the next 30 years collected from 99% of the population are going to go to 20 corporations who are going to get those contra contracts. So one model we had was the boycott model. And I remember, the, and so do you, the Montgomery bus boycott. They knew that those companies depended on the black bus riders for their economic survival. And their original target was just to, to, you know, to make the bus company give in. But as we all know, it got picked up on the news, and it turned out to be an extraordinary effective mechanism of educating other people on what was going on. I was a young MIT faculty when, uh, well, it was a group of black employees at Polaroid Corporation in Cambridge. Polaroid was making the ID system that the apartheid re uh, regime used. And they wanted Polaroid to stop, to stop making it. And then we ended up having at MIT students and faculty brought together asking MIT to divest uh, its, uh, its holdings in corporations doing business in South Africa. Of course, the university resisted. I am sure that it was, for my colleagues who are biology faculty, graduate students, and postdoctoral fellows, it was in that battle that they learned what apartheid was. They knew some bad was going on in South Africa, but it was a kind of very, very vague. So that turned out to be effective at many levels, directly, economically, and then remember the sports boycotts. Teams weren't, you know, right, so that became very powerful. Well, a couple of years ago, a uh, colleague, a physics colleague who's very important in this work, Max Tegmacher and I, we were at a conference in New York about nuclear weapons, and we sat through 40 talks, and none of the 40 people had any ideas, as far as we were concerned, about how you would do anything about this. They all gave very good talks, and very knowledgeable, the weapons and the nuclear deterrence and this and that and the other thing. But Susie was there, and she described this economic campaign, don't bank on the bomb. And Max and I had a cup of coffee afterwards and we said, those people got the right idea. You gotta stigmatize this industry. But if Americans don't know that it's a business, if they just think that it's soldiers, sailors, and national security, you know, we're not gonna get very far. So we decided uh, we're gonna bring the don't bank on the bomb campaign um, in, into the US. We, we were in Cambridge, so Cambridge seemed uh, unnatural. The beauty of the Don't Bank on the Bomb campaign doesn't take a whole lot of folks, right? If a municipality, ha Susie will talk to you about individual action. I want to talk about group actions. If a municipality has employees that had a pension fund, or a college or university has an endowment, and even churches have endowments, a small group of people can go to them and ask that they divest from those corporations that manufacture nuclear weapons. And the Future of Life Institute, Future of Life Institute, I should have a flyer, they will, they will tell you, you tell them what the town is or what the city or what the church is, and they'll tell you, you know, you go to the website, and they'll tell you whether that pension fund owns companies making new weapons. Well, the Cambridge Pension Fund owned oh, Lockheed Mar Martin, the leading, the, the, the leading nuclear weapons uh, contractor in, in the United States, making the missile warheads and, and, and the missiles. Um, and we went to the city council with a, uh, what do you call it, a resolution. Actually, in Cambridge, it was called, it's an order. It's, it's, it's called, called an order. Um, and 
you know, we had a base in the community, so we didn't only have nuclear weapons people. I talked about affordable housing, and you know, that that's, was why we didn't, why we had a housing shortage. Other people talked about why we couldn't build a green line to Somerville, because they were building nuclear submarines, subways, not submarines. And we got the unanimous vote um, that the pension fund should divest. In this past year, countries, um, about 135 countries, led by South Africa, among, uh, Ireland, Austria, uh, banned nuclear weapons. Yeah. Come on. It's amazing. Yeah. Like, you know, this is right now. This is this is amazing, especially because nuclear weapons are right at the top of the media agenda right now because nuclear weapons are, are on everybody's mind because they are freaking terrifying, horrifying things and there's a couple of dudes threatening each other with toys that could kill all of us. Um, and so they're at the top of the agenda and it's an opportunity for us to really to push this. Why did they get banned? Because they're inhumane because they cause catastrophic consequences and because no one should have them. Every moment at sea, there's 700 times the entire firepower of the Second World War. The explosive power of the Second World War, including the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs, times 700 at sea every moment around Europe. We talk to the banking industry, pa banks, pension funds, investment firms, like asset managers, and what we do is we talk to them about weapons and why they should not allow our money to be invested in weapons. This new ban treaty prohibits assistance with the manufacture and production of nuclear weapons, right? Yeah. yeah. During the negotiations, about 20 countries made it really clear. To them, assistance also includes investment. And Swedbank does not invest in nuclear weapon producers anymore. Yeah. It's really cool. But seriously, it was like three people posting on a Facebook page. And again, Sweden is, is small. Sweden is, is, you know, is not a big, not that big. Belgium's a little bit bigger. And in Belgium, they are so mad at me because I couldn't include them in last year's report, but this KBC bank, you know, changed their policy because we, we put out a big op-ed in a, in a Belgian uh, newspaper, and we said, this bank invests and is profiting off of weapons of terror. And we really like blew it up, you know. And so this is, you know, this is not a good thing. And so KBC bank contacted me directly. <laughs> and we're like, um, no, we're not. We said, well, yeah, yeah, you are. And we showed them the report. He's like, yeah, you, you are. And they said, well, no, well, no, well, no, we're not. And then I said, well, prove it. Make a policy. Do something. So they did. It's the U.S. of all places. We saw um, a very good, very nice statement. It's not a policy yet, but a very nice statement from Amalgamated Bank. And Amalgamated, because of client pressure, and it was... It was one guy? It was, okay, it was two people. And one guy who kind of kept putting, kept calling and calling and calling and calling, going into the branch and, okay, you can't do it, who can do it? And he kept pushing. Since July, not like it was a long-term campaign, um, and he got Amalgamated Bank to issue a statement on Wednesday that they do not invest in weapons. Full stop. This kind of thing is, it's super exciting because it gives us these little wins. And it feels good to win stuff. It feels good to, to have success. It's inspiring, it's hopeful. And it's, you know, it's better than coffee. Peace, salam, shalom. 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 You keep that bark going.
for peace, Salam Shalom. We will work for peace, Salam Shalom. Stupidity. People knew that this was a civil war. We had been through that. The communists had won. In 1954, we went to Geneva and we sold them out. We sold Ho Chi Minh out in Geneva in 1954 in the Geneva Conference. They had won. And they said, well, you know, wait two years and, and we'll have elections and the elections never happened. Who helped sell Ho Chi Minh out? Russia. <laughs> okay. Now, I happen to look at things through Russian eyes, at least in those days. And so you saw those threats that were going on, those, those bombers headed across the North Pole. It was supposed to scare the Russians, right? Well, why were they trying to scare the Russians? Anybody remember? Well, this was the real bugaboo for me because they wanted Russia to, quote, use its influence in Hanoi and get them to stop. Now, <laughs> I learned pretty quickly that the Russians had no influence at Hanoi, okay? No, zero influence, okay? They had sold Hanoi out like the rest of the folks in 1954. Harriman, who was the expert on Russia and knew all this stuff, you know, he's got a real good pedigree, he said, certainly the Russians will help us out here. <laughs> and McGovern said, no way are they gonna do that. Now, who got the ear of the president? I'll, I'll, I'll guess you, I'll, I'll, you know. This, it was so frustrating to me that it appeared to me that Harriman, this was not just a political ploy, that Harriman really thought, and Nixon really thought, by sending threatening B-52 bombers over the North Pole to threaten Russia so that Russia could use its influence in Hanoi, that was crazy, and nobody told Nobody told the president that Russia doesn't have any influence in Hanoi, and besides, it has no incentive to help you out here. Its big incentive is its struggle with China, and if he were to help America out, man, the Chinese would have a field day. The Chinese were accusing the Russians of failing their communist neighbors. So much so that the Chinese prevented Russian shipments of arms through China to help the North Vietnamese. So I published my story, May, June, 1967. 1967. Remember all that stuff that went on there in 1967? So here in Washington, we're trying to break through and we're trying to tell, look, LBJ, you ain't gonna seal off the Ho Chi Minh Trail. We will work for peace, Salam Shalom. We will work for peace, Salam Shalom. Jerusalem. Ramallah, in Tel Aviv, in Washington, in Gaza City, in Charlottesville, in Tripoli, in Cairo, we believe in peace, we believe in peace. I don't think the president was necessarily deceived by this. It was a question of deceiving the public in which uh, Westmoreland was cooperating with the president on that question of, uh, of deceiving the public, essentially. So the Tet Offensive occurs and blows through that uh, on the inspired by the leak of the 206,000 requests which created a, called a firestorm in Congress. People were very concerned about that. And that reaction 
persuaded me after a decade of being a very good secret keeper, like yourself, Ray, in the administration. And I don't know if you felt this way, but up till, I imagine you did, that up till then, I thought leakers were really were uh, not traitors to the country necessarily, but betraying their uh, promise to keep secrets, betraying their, their boss and their teammates and the administration and whatever. It was, a, it was the wrong thing to do. And when I realized that telling the truth about a uh, totally deceptive uh, policy being described by the president uh, could be actually a very effective democratic thing, could wake up congressmen to their duties to uh, look critically at this war and to change the policy. So at that point, I began to leave. But the big difference, it seems to me, is that then we had reporters on the ground. Then we hadn't learned yet how to embed people, and I mean the term literally. You embed people, you sleep with them, and you start to begin to think like them, and it's a natural human thing. Even, what's his name? Uh, the fellow from McClatchy. Uh, he went to Afghanistan, embedded with some troops, and he became a big fan of the Afghan war. My God, that's terrible. I saw him later, and I said, well, you lost it? He said, no, I, 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 I was, they were firing at us. Two, two very fast uh, points here. One, there's been a study uh, done at Harvard, and it's a number that even McNamara himself admitted to, which was an estimate of deaths in Vietnam at 3.8 million, uh, and that's not counting Laos and Cambodia. Uh, the other point, just to bring the topic of this conference back in, and the re reason that Peter Kuznick suggested episode seven as the one we should watch, uh, was because the natural environment of Vietnam was utterly destroyed, utterly destroyed, never to recover. And environmentalists, people who care about the environment, people, the, the, the movement for our earth ought to be talking about Vietnam and the horrors of Vietnam and the tragedy and the lessons of Vietnam and getting Vietnam history right just as much as the peace movement. Uh -huh, yeah. If they can count the billions that loser says he's worth, why can't they count our votes? If they can count the times that Breitbart denied Obama's U.S. birth, why can't they count our votes? We're not done. We're not tired. We won't stop until Steve already worked. There's another victory for us. When they claimed he won the electoral college fair and square, we said, oh, why can't you count our votes? Voter suppression and ID laws gave him much more than his share. And why can't you count our votes? We're not done. We're not tired. to tell it to him in person, but he can't be alone in a room with me. I'm so dangerous. <laughs> we should have a, like a women's walk-in on Mike Pence. <laughs> Counting money, that one easy corporate donations to his foundations. Conflicts of interest in the name of business, scandals to the maxes. When are you gonna show your taxes? Oh. If you can count 140 characters in a tweet, why can't you count our votes? Her three million vote lead should have been your defeat. And why can't you count our votes? We're not done, we're not tired. We won't stop until Donald Trump, you're fired. Why can't you count our votes? Um, Theresa May Chuck, also known as Tu My Chuck, um, was born in Saigon, Vietnam, shortly after the horrendous war that bombed her people and her homeland. She and her family survived, although her parents were separated for a long time. 
Chuck and her brother and her mother escaped Vietnam in a ship crowded with hungry, sick, and frightened immigrants. Under political asylum, they settled in California, where eventually they reunited with her father, who had spent nine years in a Viet Cong re-education camp. Chuck writes about war and her personal and family history, out of her uh, personal history beyond her cultural heritage, and apart from her family, Chuck finds her own individuality in her poems. The poem is entitled, The Decade the Rainforest Died. The Decade the Rainforest Died by Theresa May Chuck. The deer did not stop running. Leopards climbed into trees that could not hide them. The Duke Langer and the white-cheeked gibbon cursed at the metal gods. We flew raining on them as they burned from napalm. Elephants choked on the smoke of gunpowder and poison, their steps a strange rhythm as they tried to fly. The thunder of bombs echoed the steps of elephants. Tigers exploded as they stepped onto landmines. In, in a forest covered with leaves, dead from Agent Orange. Fallen trees and decomposing bodies of animals and people, the earthworms were washed away in monsoons with soil that could no longer grab onto roots. The Javan rhinoceros and the wild water buffaloes that were still alive wandered aimlessly, and weary with M16s and AK-47s, we marched quietly and steadily, not knowing why we were killing each other. Stationed entirely domestically prior to 9-11, I witnessed and at times was a participant in various forms of environmental destruction on behalf of the military industrial complex. Some of these included the laying of Constantine wire, which was used to secure perimeters during training exercises. I witnessed wild horses and other animals getting caught and ripped to shreds by this wire out in the field. We would discover them um, in the morning. Um, they would, of course, be uh, dead, perished of those animals, and many times we, we wouldn't give it a second thought. We would simply um, do our best to, to, cover, to cover up those animals. Um, I would also add that we had a number of uh, diesel fuel spills while I was out on training exercises um, when refueling and also leaks from the vehicles that caused obvious harm to, uh, to ecological systems. The uh, firing of small arms, and as Alice mentioned during my introduction, I was a cannon crew member, so we fired artillery rounds uh, from our tanks, our howitzers, into the backwoods of Oklahoma, Georgia, Alaska, Louisiana, California, <laughs> uh, frequently with no idea where these rounds were, were headed, were going, where they landed. Where this idea that the, the, there are the elect and there are the chosen and the, their, their station in life is a sign that you're predestined to salvation. That's, that's really the, the religion of this, that's the national religion. And capitalism, I would say, is a religion, not just an economic system. And its sacrament is inequality. Because in a system where elect, where you're proving that you're more have station, that you're more favored than the other, then you can't actually have a system that creates equity and equality. So you get a system that creates corporate rights, investor rights, rights of transnational capital. Really crazy shit. So um, can we read this together? This is our mission statement. With heart, please. We, the corporations, transcending the boundaries of nations, in order to protect us from the people, ensure our right to extract and exploit, provide the defense of profit with impunity, and secure the blessings of wealth and privilege for those who have it already. Do ordain and appropriate this Constitution of the United States of America. Bravo. Beautifully done. So what's the alternative? We're offering that th nothing of actual importance is actually for sale. That this idea of salvation that's been sold to us and is woven into our society is, is, is toxic. This, 
the, 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 the salvation in the most original sense, I offer that it's, it's actually just a sense of survival of a community in place over time. So our ethic is fundamentally, and our actions have to be built upon an ethic and uh, reflect value system that we're all in this together. So we expose mismatches. We, you know, who would Jesus deport? We flew a banner over a detention center. Um, there's probably lots of examples of that. But motherhood is all about protecting what you love. And if you don't like the word motherhood because that's what they use, but an unassailable good. We have to make sure that our work is as close to an unassailable good as possible. So this is a kayak flotilla with a heart. It's just, and what I find about kayakivism and such is that it connects people to what they love. This is on the beaches, it's 200 people and umbrellas and such. Connecting to what people love, the aspiration of the we, the people marching through the, the Women's March in DC. That is, that's how we draw people in, by being so beautiful and, um, and resonating with, those, with this other paradigm and making space for that paradigm in our, all of our lives in this society. I have been involved in this work since the early 1980s. And um, as you can see from Bill's slideshow, there are, and from what Brian mentioned, there are so many incredible tactics that we have all used in this work for creative activism for the planet and for peace and beyond, right? And the tactics are the sexy thing, the fun things, the really great way to hook people in. And that's why we talk about them so much because they're so fun and so easy to focus on. But the true thing is about this is that without strategy, without putting the tactics into that pyramid of action, we very rarely get what we want out of our tactics. And as artists, as cultural workers, we sometimes have a great idea for something. We just want to go ahead and make that gilded painting or that giant puppet, which is one of the things that I do, uh, make giant puppets and march in the street and still walk and climb and make banners, all that stuff. But without the framework for that particular tactic within a strategy, it doesn't deliver. And so this is where I want to talk about. I want to talk a little bit about strategy today. So what does make a campaign successful? One of the most important things around movement success is, in fact, adherence to nonviolent action. Now, I'm not talking about uh, nonviolence as a moral or philosophical belief system or a way of living. I'm talking about strategic nonviolent action, which allows you to not to work together as a community without resort to violent action to win your campaigns. And why is it that nonviolent action, in fact, we have data now from Maria Stefan and Erica Chenoweth's book, because nonviolent campaigns are larger. It's almost all about numbers. They're on, on average 11 times larger than violent movements. And you might think, how come? Because they're more accessible. They're more accessible to everyone. So violent campaigns, you find a lot of young people, mostly male, who were willing to hurt each other or be hurt. When you, when you adhere to nonviolence, when you have a public commitment, you welcome everyone, wherever they're at, in all their different capacities. And this also opens you up to solidarity or unity. And we heard some mention about building alliances and thinking intersectionally about all of the different oppressions we have to face. This allows us or encourages us to do this work. And thirdly, the third big characteristic around this is the ability to plan. And of course, you can plan for violence too, but when you commit to planning in a nonviolent campaign, it opens up the potential for escalation and strategic sequencing and most importantly, innovation and creativity and training and helping people figure out how to do this work better. And when you open yourself up to innovation, that's a key for bigger and broader involvement of folks and also integration of different cultures, different attributes, different skill levels and what the whole community and everyone in it has to offer. Preparation for war, even if we never fight that war, is equally toxic for people and the planet. The cost of a weapon systems, the cost of any of the production and the actual process of producing these toxic systems are in fact shortchanging and stealing from social services and human needs and what the planet needs. The process of othering, that you are not an equivalent living being as we are, or that the earth is not equivalent living, a living being as we are, as humans are. And so 
This means that we are allowed to distance ourselves and disconnect ourselves from each other and the living beings on this planet and the understanding that both war itself, preparation for war, and the, under, the psychological underpinning of othering and distancing ourselves is also contributing to this problem. I love the idea, and I, when, uh, if anybody really wants to run with this, of actually starting a, what we call uh, putting in place the world to be now, prefigurative work, envisioning the future. We need a climate emergency management agency. Everybody's heard of FEMA. We need a SEMA. Mm -hmm. We know we do. <laughs> we can That's do great. it. Sure. We can easily put that in place. Mm -hmm. And people have heard about maybe the tactic of um, the yes men where mm -hmm. they do um, identity correction and they go out and they pretend yep. to be Exxon Mobil or whoever it is and they, then they say the correct things that Exxon Mobil should say like we know we're killing the planet and we're sorry and we're going to stop producing fossil fuels now and switch to solar and renewables, right? And then Exxon has to say, oh, no, 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 we're not doing that. We're not about that at all. We're about screwing the planet. So if we had a climate emergency management agency, we could do that, a founding convention, anytime we wanted. We know exactly who should be invited from the agencies that are actually real in the United States, right? And we could invite those people with little asterisks, whether it's the Secretary of State, the Department of Energy chairman, it doesn't really matter if they come. We don't really <laughs> need them to, given who they are now. What we need to do is have climate emergency management, yeah. SEMA officials anywhere in the United States. You know, people could have local offices. You could figure out, you could have uniforms, you could have badges, you could issue citations for communities that are failing to meet the requirements that SEMA puts out for renewable energy, for lighting, for what, I mean, this is a viable thing to do. Yeah. We had the most exciting workshop, I'm sure. And the question we had is, what critical mass is required to reach the tipping point? I don't think anybody knows the answer to that. Some people say 50%. Most people say 15%. If 15% of our nation believed that we could be a world beyond war or a nation beyond fossil fuels, that could happen. But well, whatever the critical mass is, the internet has the potential to reach a wide audience rather quickly. And so we need to take advantage of the internet. Letting people know we're not against them, even though we may be against something that involves their work or, or you know, their, their weapons, military uh, jobs that pollute the planet, really letting them know we are not against them and we want to work with them work on solutions and to establish trust. Uh, dialogues like something along the lines of truth and reconciliation. Uh, dialogue practices to bring victims and perpetrators together. They begin to develop empathy without really having a conversation even. So how can we use that as a tool? A great example on a peace education program for parents. So you could bring um, Parents can come to this program, they can bring their children. Um, we heard about uh, an example where someone organized a short screening of a film, and the topic was violence in media. It addressed the influence of video games and how that actually in impacts children to accept violence as a normal part of daily life, of killing people as part of a game. It just seems very natural, that's pretty scary to us. So it encourages parents that when kids have free time to have them do something else, maybe watch something peace related. The idea of reflection, helping people learn how to ask questions, both in analytical terms and in terms of moral and ethical reflection, our sense of values and who we strive to be and connect with people around that. We're looking at the nuclear bomb as divestment, but there was, of course, there's a big campaign being launched through Code Pink. Medea was in our workshop to divest from all of the military. So we're looking at nuclear to begin with, but we want to extend it. And we think that in the light of the current conversation, nuclear is an easy sell. So how do we do it? Susie Snyder, some of you heard her on a panel, gave us amazing an incredible rundown on her don'tbankonthebomb.com. Please, just look at it. 
One thing that I think everyone should know is there is a great book written by a professor who teaches here at American University named David Vine. He's written a book called Base Nation. I think a lot of you have heard about it, but still I think it's important that it is read and the information in it is shared because it really goes over everything that you can think of about uh, the impacts of military bases ac uh, across the world. Um, the great thing about our workshop was uh, almost every single uh, person who attended has been to some foreign military base in some form. Um, so they were very familiar, but it was good to uh, open up to a discussion where we can learn from where people have gone, because there's just so many bases, so many countries, so many places. Um, one thing we definitely recommended, uh, something that Anne and I try to do, there's no way I can catch up to Anne, but visit these bases, visit the resistance that's going on around the world. Uh, I specifically talk more about South Korea and Okinawa, which I've been to several times now, and I think, you know, you know, the Korean crisis is going on, the Asia Pacific is a big deal, um, and you know, there's these tiny villages, the indigenous populations, that are leading these fights against the empire. Right on. Right? We have uh, the indigenous Okinawan people, we have the villagers from Jeju Island, we have people all over South Korea trying to stop this crisis from getting any worse than it can. And these are the people who have been doing daily protests for over 10 years straight. Uh, you know, I can't imagine the amount of organizing it takes to do something every single day for over 10 years. Um, so visiting these places, building relationships with them, and bringing those stories home to Americans, everyday Americans who have no idea that there are 800 bases, what these uh, bases are doing, and, and share the stories of how people are impacted in Jeju Island, Okinawa, and everywhere else around the world. And also there's a great new coalition that just started uh, called the Coalition Against U.S. Foreign Bases. Uh, you can find more information at noforeignbases.org. I was in South Korea. I wasn't able to get to North Korea because um, Donald Trump uh, has made it illegal for Americans to go there and um, haven't gotten nationality anywhere else yet. In Korea, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with what's happening in South Korea. We hear a lot about North Korea and how it will be, um, I don't know, you might have seen John McCain calling for the extinction of North Korea on, Jake Ta on his interview with Jake Tapper. And then Jake Tapper asks him a hard follow-up question. How's Cindy? How's Hadley? How's, he names like every member of his extended family. How's Ebenezer, you know? He doesn't ask, why did you just call, make a genocidal threat against 25 million people? Um, you know, we hear a lot of rhetoric, but we don't know what's actually happening on the ground or what kind of impossible situation people on both sides of the 38th parallel are being put in. And I help, it helped me understand um, when I spent just a week in Seoul and got to meet with some anti-war activists, um, anti-war or you could call it peace activity in South Korea focuses around the THAAD system. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the SAT. I mean, you know, probably most hands are going to go up here. One of the things they told me uh, when I said, what can I tell Americans, what can I talk to about, you know, when I come back from Korea is just tell them what the THAAD system is and tell them what it's doing to us. It's the terminal high altitude anti-missile defense system. It costs a billion dollars. That's a billion dollars to Lockheed Martin, which is just down the swamp. And, you know, employs a lot of people you'll see drinking in the bars. A lot of new, um, you know, loft style apartments are going up in f formerly, you know, historically black communities in Washington to accommodate those employees as this defense industry expands. A lot of people don't connect gentrification in D.C. to the expansion of these, of the defense industry through these massive contracts. Now, under the last administration in South Korea, there was an agreement that South Korea would pay for the THAAD system. They'd pay $1 billion. That sparked massive protests, helped lead to the candlelight protests that brought in President Moon. Um, Moon Jae-in is supposed to be, you know, was supposed to be someone who believed in peace. That was what his constituency wanted, and he's pretty much sold out to Trump. Um, for various reasons. Now, that ir irrespective of what the Moon administration does, um, these protests have forced the U.S. to at least pay part of the price tag on the THAAD system. 
um, but Seoul still has to pay for everything that, you know, everything that is required to accommodate the THAAD system. That means extreme pain for the melon farmers in Soju province in the town of, of uh, Sosongri. These are melon farmers, these are mostly older women. Um, grannies who are fighting police in the streets right now. They have a nightly vigil. They're fighting with their canes against batons. They're setting up road. This is like literally true. You can see videos of them whacking cops with their canes. Uh, they have been, com you know, they, they've become militant about this um, because they are, their melon farms are going to be affected. They will be forced, some of them will be forced off their land, their Buddhist shrines will be destroyed, and there is going to be radar contamination, although Lockheed Martin says no, you know, the radar is invisible, you can't really see it, you know. There's no proof. These, I mean, the system relies on radar that's so powerful that it is likely to cause harm um, not only to humans but to the environment in general in an area which is very sensitive where, you know, you're talking about generations and generations of melon farmers and people who've been observing their uh, faith in this area whose shrines are threatened now. I mean, it's based on a golf course but it affects the entire area. Um, so the protests around Korea are ongoing involving um, union members, uh, students, people from all um, walks of life, and uh, many of them are um, living in fear because South Korea is not actually a democracy as we understand it. Of course, we aren't here yet. either, but they have a national security law which was just passed in 1988. Um, they, you know, came out of World War II and spent decades as a right-wing dictatorship. And under this national security law, um, anyone who's considered a communist sympathizer, who has ties to people in the North, um, leftist protest organizers can be interrogated, their homes can be raided, and they can be jailed. And Rachel Maddow is really like the liberal, the first liberal demagogue. She's like the liberal Rush Limbaugh. And her ratings are up massively. She's the top figure in cable news right now. Highest ratings. During the Obama era, her ratings were in the toilet. Top ratings because the majority of the content on her show relates to Russia and Russia fear mongering. And so far, her dots haven't connected. You just have to keep watching until the dots. I got tax, Trump's tax forms, and they don't show anything about Russia, but maybe if you watch tomorrow, they will. <laughs> this has deeply affected American opinion. I mean, we're sanctioning Russia, we're raiding their consulate in San Francisco. We're removing Russian officials over a abstract belief that hasn't been proven with any concrete evidence that they helped collude with Donald Trump and interfered with our democracy and that has fueled the conflict on the ground in the Ukraine. Beyond that, who is the U.S. envoy to the Ukraine? Have you heard about him? You heard a lot about Steve Bannon, the big bad Bannon, who actually, you know, opposed the surge to Afghanistan. Um, I love Code Pink, but I, I just found it strange that they had a petition addressed to General John Kelly, a military general, appealing to remove Bannon. Um, I think we should have another petition about uh, actually removing John Kelly and all of the generals. Now, just in closing, I think you should know about this. Um, the U.S. envoy who's supposed to be in charge of making peace in Ukraine is named Kurt Volker and he is a veteran neoconservative operative who is simultaneously the executive director of the McCain Institute. John McCain was the driving force behind the NDA. He's like, I'm not going out without millions more people being killed. Not, not, not so fast. Um, and the McCain Institute is a fake human rights initiative which is funded not only by Saudi Arabia and other wonderful human rights um, champions like that, but also by the BGM group, which is a major you know, element of the swamp here. It is an arms contractor, and BGM group is headed by Ed Rogers, who is the lead lobbyist for Raytheon. So you have a figure whose salary is paid by the lobbyist for Raytheon in charge of making peace in the Ukraine, and he is also lobbying for arms to the Ukrainian military. This is just a small snapshot of the kind of cronyism that we see in Washington. And you know, when we're talking about Raytheon, I mean, they've made a killing also in sending thousands of tow missiles to keep the conflict going in Syria. We have General Dynamics, which is making the MK-82 bombs, which are the main weapon driving death in Yemen. These 
people are right down the street. I think it's time that we meet them at their doorsteps. Yeah. I think that's where protest activity, when you talk about draining the swamp, that's the first part of the swamp that should be targeted. And you know, their offices are here and I haven't seen any protests there, so I'm happy to you know, join you guys. And uh, we've been talking here about the environmental impact on war, and I see in my visits in Kabul over the last seven or so years the, uh, that people who live there are actually experiencing uh, many of the worst fears that, that we have of, of ecological collapse. And this is an example. This is the Kabul River, and this was just taken on Tuesday, last Tuesday. And it's September, the water would not normally be rushing, but it would be full of water. It was several years ago. What's happening is Kabul is a city, once quite beautiful, I'm sure, very gracious place from everything that I hear. Uh, in, two th in 1979, when the Russians invaded, the population was about 500,000. In 2001, when the United States invaded, the population was about a million. Today, it is five million and growing. And the, the, uh, several things are happening. One is the water table is sinking since 2004, one and a half meters a year. And totally unregulated, people are building, uh, digging, digging more wells. The, uh, now, one thing that's happening, the, the, the population is growing, and we have, in the last year, 700,000 refugees were repatriated to Afghanistan uh, from European countries, from uh, Iran, and from, from Pakistan, forcibly repatriated into the country. And, and they figure that in this coming year, there may be up to three million more people added to the population of, of this country. People are coming into the city because it's dangerous to live in the countryside. He said a crate of melons will rot on the side of the road while a shipment of heroin will get to the United States. Good afternoon. It's, um, of course, a privilege to be here with all of you and with all due gratitude for everybody who worked so hard to organize the conference. Bob, thanks for pulling us together, and Max and Brian. Thank you for the wake-up call and for the heartbreak. Um, every heart to love will come, but like a refugee. You know, how did we get here? Of course, it's a long, long, long story, but my mind goes back to Rio de Janeiro and Energy Summit when President Bush Sr. said the American way of life is a non-negotiable. And I'm sure many people in here were saying, I'll negotiate. <laughs> the American way of life is a non-negotiable. And then we learn that it's uh, sewage trickling down the hillsides into Kabul today. Madeleine Albright, 1998, on the Today Show, said, if we have to use force, we must. We are America. We're the indispensable nation. We stand taller than others. We see further into the future. We're, what, 6% of the world's population. We're not the indispensable nation. I want to tell you something that just sort of discloses some of my own vulnerability to exceptionalism. I, I went to Ireland as a guest of the Sisters of St. Bridget of Kildare, Kathy, you'll be coming to Ireland now for the 10th anniversary. And it was the 10th anniversary of the pit stop plowshares when, uh, God bless them, five Irish people did two and a half million dollars worth of damage to a US Navy warplane parked on the tarmac. And um, it happened to be in 2003, slightly before the US shock and awe attack had happened, and I had gone over to, uh, to Ireland from Baghdad and gave the best talk I could about economic sanctions and the effects. And um, three nights later, they went out and attacked the plane on the top. I didn't tell them to do it. But anyway, um, so I was their defense witness, and I was pretty sure they're done for. But um, they had very, very good lawyers. And so they wanted to celebrate the 10th anniversary of that 
time. And so the Sisters of St. Bridget very wisely said, Kathy, please, will you meet the high school students? And the, I was to meet them in a field. <laughs> and the, these high school kids, you know, they're all dressed up in their plaid blazers and their green shorts, whatever. And they're all kind of poking each other. What are we doing out here in this field? And an Irish historian met with us. And we were outside of a derelict building. It was falling apart. And it was a workhouse from the time when people in Ireland, living in a land blighted by potato famine as the Brits were taking the potatoes off to other shores. Uh, and so many people ran out of any kind of food sustenance work. And they went to the workhouse. And then the Irish historian took us a little further on. And then we were at the graveyard. Because that was the route from the workhouse to the graveyard. And the famine in Ireland caused many people to become refugees, the Irish historian then read to the young men who were no longer snickering and laughing the names of the people from just that village who had gone, well it was a suburb of Dublin, who had gone from the workhouse to the grave. And the names sounded very familiar. What I didn't know was that at that same time in the late Victorian era, as many as 20 million people minimum, possibly 50 million people total, in northern China, in India, in Brazil, in the Maghreb, also died because they didn't have enough to eat. There were El Nino effects that no scientist could have observed or understood then. There were railways and people could observe and understand that food could have been gotten to many, many of those people. And none of them had committed crimes, but they were people who didn't count. And now here today, here we are facing 20 million people could starve to death in Nigeria, Somaliland, South Sudan, and Yemen. Even as we are you know, preparing with this um, idea of an anti-war environmental uh, movement, of a fusion of it, we have to also not just think about wars as um, foreign wars, right? There are plenty of domestic wars being fought right here in the United States of America in urban warfare um, at the hands of state-sanctioned militarized police. And we have to even ask ourselves, does posse comitatus even necessarily exist anymore, especially for urban inner city communities? That's really, really important because those are impediments to climate um, justice as well. Um, the fact that every time there is a massive event, militarized police has a way of, of buffering so many of the uh, social justice gains that we have gotten over the years. We saw it in uh, New Orleans uh, post-Katrina. We've already been seeing it in Florida where a Polk County Sheriff was checking people's identifications to make sure they didn't have warrants for their arrest, checking identification to see uh, people's immigration status. And um, that's all linked, you know, to the climate crisis. So we have to talk about that. And, um, you know, when we're talking about our solutions, you know, even with this advent of, you know, I was just down in Florida where people are mad as hell. You know, they're seeing Florida Power and Light who have been so adverse to the expansion of solar power in a state that has the moniker the Sunshine State, so go figure. <laughs> um, but um, solar power generators were brought into neighborhoods, right? And people were powering their homes while Florida Power and Light were stumbling to get lines on that are connected to frack gas to get people back online. Meanwhile, people are powering their homes for free with solar panels. But what we have to understand that um, with this advent of war that we're talking about, a lot of these wars are really for one thing, right? They don't hate us for our freedom with all respect to uh, George W. Bush. Um, what we really have is a people um, um, tax dollars being used for an international security force for the protection of resources that we deem necessary to keep our lights on and more, uh, more importantly to fuel hypercapitalism. Thank you World Beyond War for this great weekend um, where I learned a lot. <laughs> I think one of the things I learned is that instead of, remember that poster that said war is unhealthy for children and other living things? When I heard Gar Smith talk about how war is killing the deer and the bison and, the, and the, uh, all these animals, I think we should just go for the animals because people care more about animals than children, I think. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think we're just at this stage where I don't know about you all, but I feel so inadequate, mm -hmm. you know? For those of us who've been doing work on these peace issues, um, we did once have a grouping that we could call a peace movement. 
Mm -hmm. And um, let me just remind you of February 15th, 2003. So you have the unpredictability of the North Korean government combined with the unpredictability of Donald Trump. And believe me, this is a very, very potentially catastrophic situation where we need a massive anti-war movement to be out in the streets and the suites and the offices and the White House to say no. Now, there's a, a part of the anti-war movement that is extremely vibrant, diverse, and has young people in it. Does anybody say, want to say what that is? Palestine movement, that's right. This is a movement that has managed to reach into the universities. In fact, I would say, after the Black Lives Matter and the climate movement, the Palestine movement is the most vibrant movement on campuses in the United States. It's quite extraordinary.